Presented by Caltech. So I have now the pleasure of introducing the next speaker, David Baltimore, who is a Caltech President Emeritus, one of our beloved and few presidents, and the Robert Andrews Milliken Professor of Biology. In addition to moonlighting as paparazzi, <laughs> David is an accomplished researcher, educator, administrator, and public advocate for science and engineering. He's considered one of the world's most influential biologists, and I'm sure Jackie would want me to add that he received his undergraduate degree in chemistry, so we set you off on the straight path from that great Swarthmore College. David was awarded the Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine in 1975 at a young age for his research into viral replication that provides the key to understanding the life cycle of retroviruses. Very, very important work in our world today. And he's published 700 peer-reviewed articles and numerous uh, other prizes, including the National Medal of Science. David, I think like Ahmed, uh, is very concerned about national science policy and like Roger, on issues such as, in his case, recombinant DNA research in the AIDS epidemic. And I think uh, we've seen David in the recent news uh, as chair of the National Academy of Sciences International Summit on Human Gene Editing. And I hope you'll comment on that um, today, David. This very powerful CRISPR-Cas technology that has enormous potential for human health um, and then ethical issues about how we're going to use this going forward. Um, David's, um, again, like Ackman and Roger, he just uh, continues to be an amazing researcher. His present research focuses on the control of the inflammatory and immune responses, as well as the use of gene therapy methods to treat HIV and cancer. And of course, this whole new modern era of engineering immunity is just so exciting particularly in oncology. Maybe he'll comment on that today as well. He's one of the true leaders in our campus helping the basic research faculty who want to uh, move in that translational direction. Now, if I may, again, on a personal note, I've done this with the other speakers who are my friends. I must say, uh, we feel very lucky to have David Baltimore and Alice Wong on the campus because I must tell you that in addition to any deep science discussion, which David will engage in, and Alice. Uh, it's always fun to compare notes with them on great wines, fly fishing, Alice getting her pilot's license, if you can believe it. And my favorite, David, is always comparing every year at Christmas time the top 10 book list for the year. And so if you'll come up, please, and give your lecture, The Future of Medicine, David. <laughs> I hope that's OK. <laughs> Good almost afternoon. Caltech is a place where you always assume that the faculty that you meet are unusual people. Unusually intense, unusually intelligent, unusually curious about the world around them. And among this group, Ahmed stands out for his intense focus on molecular motion, his remarkable creativity, and his wide-ranging intellect and interests. Over my years at Caltech, Ahmed and I have often gone together to lunch, yes to Celestino, <laughs> and talked about many topics. The news of the day, the long-range future for the Middle East, the behavior of proteins, the dawning of the era of molecular medicine, just to name a few. They have been some of the most interesting conversations I have had at Caltech. So when Ahmed asked that I participate in this symposium, I was glad to have that honor and the opportunity to say a few words. 
he gave me a title, The Future of Medicine. Uh, he said I could alter it, that I didn't really have to speak about it. But I took it as a challenge. And as you'll see, it got me thinking about a very wide range of topics. Medicine is not a constant. Diseases come in many forms, and the responses to disease at any one time stretches the boundaries of knowledge and technology. We have come a long way in medicine in the last century, turning it from an empirical and often futile exercise into a now and often successful attempt to intervene in pathologic processes at a very fundamental level, as we heard from Roger Kornberg. The initial advances were in the prevention of disease, mainly by sanitation and behavior modification, the diagnosis of disease with imaging technologies and molecular probes, and the treatment of disease with pharmaceuticals. Extraordinary advances have been made, particularly against diseases caused by bacteria, the historic causes of enormous mortality. But this has left us to fight even tougher enemies, cellular diseases, systems diseases, genetic diseases, environmental diseases, and diseases with mixtures of causes that are often hard to unravel. This switch, at least in the developed world, from a focus on infectious disease to a focus on non-infectious diseases, actually produced a hiatus in the rapid progress of the 20th century against disease in the developed world. But progress is now picked up again, as we've begun to learn how to use tools, new tools, that have been invented in the 21st century and that uh, are the products of, of base, mainly of basic research laboratories. So let me just start with seven new medical technologies that are revolutionizing the way we conceive of disease. Genomic analysis and big data. This started with the sequencing of the human genome, announced first in the year 2000. And so everything that's unraveled from that is a 21st century invention. And the, as the sequencing has become cheaper and cheaper and faster and faster, the data is piling up. We now have sequences of thousands of human genomes. We will have sequences of hundreds of thousands. And they're telling us an enormous amount about the correlation between particular gene configurations and disease. And that is giving us clues as to how we approach diseases that have heretofore been opaque to us. There are also new immunologic approaches to disease, in particular to cancer. We used to say that the immune system was a fabulous system for dealing with infectious diseases, but that it failed to deal with cancer. But now with new approaches, including gene therapy methods, we're seeing remarkable, actually, cures of cancer coming from the application of new immunologic approaches. And gene therapy itself is a developing field. It, it dates back to the 20th century. Uh, but for a long time, nobody could figure out what it was really good for, how to really control it, use it. And that's all changing, changing as we speak. And new diseases are becoming subject to gene therapy methodologies. Gene targeting technologies introduced uh, by Peter a moment ago. Uh, I'm not going to try to explain them, uh, except to say that CRISPR-Cas9 uh, has given us the ability to manipulate genes in situ in the cells of organisms. And that means we can go in and surgically change a single nucleotide in a gene from a situation where it's causing disease to a situation where it's neutral. It gives us the opportunity to add genes, to subtract genes, to do 
more or less anything we want to shape the genome. Now, we can't do this all today. In fact, these techniques are really the result of work in the last three years, so they're brand new. But there's no question which way they're going. And as I, I've often said, if you can define a question as precisely as we can define the questions around CRISPR-Cas9, those questions will get answers. Stem cell therapies. We've, only, we, we've known about stem cells in biology for a long time, but we didn't, weren't able to harness them. Um, in the last 20 years, we figured out how to harness them. And they are now the objects of intense study to provide new ways of dealing with disease, particularly in the areas of building new, organism, new organs, um, as well as providing therapy for uh, aging um, or damaged parts of the body. Modern imaging technologies are doing amazing things. I grew up knowing that there was a limit to the light microscope. It could only see down to a certain wavelength. Um, but that we've long passed those, those limits uh, with modern techniques, and we can now see inside organisms in ways we could never do before that are going to change our changing diagnosis. And targeted drug development, using some of the techniques that, that uh, Roger talked about, but many, many others, um, and wedding our drug development with genomic analysis so that we can target with great precision and using then uh, techniques of structural biology to wed those two um, technologies. Now, I want to put in an aside here. Um, but let me give you the bottom line. Uh, as the President of the United States is loving to say, uh, this is giving us precision medicine. And to me, what precision medicine means is that we can target diseases with precision, without side effects, without missing, with a real knowledge of what's going on in the underlying molecular biology. And that is going to be 21st, medicine, 21st century medicine. But what I want to do is add one little footnote. Roger quite correctly talked about the tremendous difficulty of having a career in molecular biology or in, in, in modern biology today. And it is difficult and it is lengthy and people aren't getting the opportunity at the right age to at least the age I was at and he was at when we did our best known work. Um, but if you look at it from the other point of view, of the list of seven technologies that I have up here. Those are all the creation of just the last 20 years. And so something's right. Something's actually happening. And I will say that almost all of the advances have been made in the United States. Now, Let's drill down a little bit in thinking about disease uh, to, to a particular disease, and that's cancer. And if you look at this set of curves, it is the age-adjusted cancer death rates in males. I'll have females coming up. Um, and what you see is that lung cancer, which is the big line, and has been the dominant cancer in males now for many years, caused obviously by smoking, is now responding to the fact that fewer and fewer people are smoking. And so the curve has turned over and mortality for lung cancer is on its way down and will continue on its way down. But there are lots of other cancers on their way down. In fact, remarkably, almost everything on here is on its way down, starting in uh, the year 1995 or so. A prostate cancer is falling. Maybe it's early diagnosis, maybe it's treatment. 
Uh, colon cancer is falling. That almost certainly is a mixture of early diagnosis and treatment. Uh, some of them have been falling for years. Stomach, liver uh, go way back. So it's not true that we're not having an effect on the cancer epidemic. We are having an effect. It's not fast. It's not complete. It will require a lot more work. But it's happening. Same thing is true for women. Lung cancer is turning over just now because women stopped, stopped smoking later, started smoking later. Um, but breast cancer is actually showing remarkable response to new uh, methodologies, colon cancer, etc. So if you add it all up, oh, sorry. If you add it all up, you see cancer death rates falling, and it's very impressive. But are the number of cancers falling or are is the mortality from cancer falling? And the answer is that the incidence, if anything, has been going up. There's a peak in there that I don't really understand very well uh, in men. But um, I think it, that was an ascertainment of, of uh, prostate cancer. But the, the uh, cancer incidence rates are more or less flat or going up. So what we're seeing is the ability to treat the disease not a fall in the occurrence of the disease. And you can see that because if, if the mortality is falling and the incidence is staying constant, then survival rates must be going up. And in fact, survival rates are going up. So if you look at all sites in 1975, 50% of people lived beyond their diagnosis for five years or more. Today, that's 68%, or today being 2010. We don't have more, I don't have more recent data. Uh, and if you look at individual cancers, you see the same thing. Breast cancer, ovarian cancer. Ovarian is very interesting because it's a very aggressive cancer, but even there, we're seeing increased uh, survival. There are some where we're not seeing much. Lung a little bit more recently, but still the numbers are very low. And pancreas is a challenge that we haven't figured out how to meet. Now, is this particular to cancer? Are we, are we seeing other diseases going up? Well, interestingly, cardiovascular disease, which is the most serious cause of, of mortality uh, in the country, is going down. Uh, this graph illustrates one thing I tell all my students never to do, and that is to make a graph that doesn't start at zero, <laughs> because that exaggerates the effect. Um, and I'm sure that's why it was done. But at least you can tell it doesn't start at zero. Um, so cardiovascular disease, particularly in men, has been falling now consistently uh, and has been continuing in the last couple of years. Uh, and so medicine is actually doing a pretty good job at dealing with, or beginning to deal with, the things that we understand. We understand a fair amount about cardiovascular disease. We understand a fair amount about cancer. We don't understand everything about any of these diseases and have a lot more work to do. So you might ask, well, is this true only in the developed world? And I came across some data recently that absolutely stunned me. And this is representative of it. It's not terrific. Uh, it's not a terrific way of seeing it. Uh, this is childhood mortality, the probability that a child will die uh, within the first five years of life. And that used to be high. This is data from Sweden. Uh, where they apparently have kept this data for since 1750. Uh, and you can see that for a long time it was more or less constant. And then starting in the 1850s with sanitation, Sweden was one of the first places to get good sanitation, uh, you started seeing a fall down to extremely low levels uh, in the present day. But the interesting thing is 
Well, in the United States, just follows along. I guess there's no data back before about 1925. Um, but the interesting thing is to look at the less developed world. So we'll take South Korea as an example. South Korea had a very high mortality rate, which fell very rapidly uh, through the 1950s and 60s uh, because of the development of sanitation and modern antibiotics. Um, but how about the really less developed world? We'll take Africa as an example. Here's Nigeria and uh, Ethiopia. And they're both falling very rapidly. And soon, the, I think, the D Millennium Development Goals will be reached um, in Africa. So we're seeing all around the world and in all kinds of diseases that medicine is actually working. What, what are particularly important? Vaccines are very important, particularly for childhood uh, diseases, bed nets, to keep malaria down has been a huge effect, had a huge effect in Africa. Uh, but general affluence of the society is probably the most important thing because that provides people with the wherewithal to put screens on their houses, to do what it takes to get to doctors, uh, to improve the health of themselves and their children. All right, so I said I was gonna talk about the future of medicine and what I've largely done is talk about the past. And the reason for that is that if we keep the present trends going using increasingly sophisticated methods, I think it's perfectly clear from extrapolating all of the curves I've shown that we're gonna get there and we're gonna reduce the mortality from a wide range of diseases in a wide range of circumstances. I'm not gonna put a date on it, uh, but, but um, it certainly looks like uh, the next 25 to 50 years uh, will be an impressive story. But there are recalcitrant diseases, diseases that we know perfectly well, uh, but that we have no way of treating, and brain diseases stand out. And then we have something which is not a disease, but is the ultimate limitation on good health, and that is aging. So I am going to focus on the real challenges of future medicine, the recalcitrant, particularly neurologic diseases, and aging. So I went to the internet and started looking for curves for the uh, death rates or disease rates, incidence rates, of neurologic disease. And I came across this remarkable curve. Uh, which shows that these diseases have been going up in incidence from the 1980s to this curve goes to 2006, presumably continues on. And there are two things about this curve that are disturbing. One is, if that's true, then even if we were successful in treating some of these diseases, we wouldn't see it in the data. The second thing is, is it true? So I read, I went and got the article that it came from, and interestingly, the authors conclude that it is not a change in incidence which is actually occurring, but a change in the recognition of the diseases. And that they don't know what the curve really ought to look like, because before 1980, our diagnostic capabilities and our recognition that people were dying of these diseases was simply so poor. So I don't have data to show you. But we certainly all know that Alzheimer's disease, other dementias, Parkinson's disease, autism, schizophrenia, many other cognitive diseases are diseases that, whether they're increasing or not increasing, are certainly a plague on our civilization. We have a little bit of understanding of the pathological processes in some of these diseases and none in others. But we have very little understanding of the initiation of disease or what drives the progression of disease, ultimately in many cases to death. 
there is a beginning progress in this area. And the progress is coming from doing what I had at the top of my list of new technologies, genetic analysis. Because although many of these diseases don't have a really defined genetic cause, they do seem to run in families. They do seem to, uh, identical twins seem to have um, of the same kind of problems, uh, which are all indications that there is a genetic component, even if it isn't an obvious single gene. Uh, and so those things we can get, we can learn. And we can look at the genes that associate, these are very difficult studies to do, but they've just recently been published. Uh, and you can see that gene A and gene B and gene C are increased in frequency, or allele A, B, and C, to be honest, um, when people have schizophrenia or autism or other diseases. Alzheimer's hasn't been terribly well, terribly responsive to this. And those genes give us clues to causation. So one of the really extraordinary things is in schizophrenia, which is a, a fairly young person's disease, uh, that it looks like the trimming of, of uh, processes on nerves is a very important aspect of the formation of that. And people who, who understand how the nervous system works will appreciate that that makes a little sense. And so not understanding these diseases at all, not knowing how they start or how they progress, it's not surprising that we have very poor treatments. It's treatments that rarely go beyond symptomatic relief of one form or another. When you think about it, if we tried to treat bacterial disease and we didn't know it was caused by a bacterium, what would we get, do? We would do what people did, as, as Roger described, bleeding people and uh, other sort of ridiculous now in, in, in retrospect methodologies. Or we treat fever. We put people in ice cube baths. They did that. Uh, but we now know about bacteria thanks to the work of wonderful bacteriologists in the 19th century uh, and antibiotics were developed. All right, I said that aging was the ultimate uh, limitation uh, and I believe that's true. Um, and so are there ways to increase human longevity? Well, the thing that we've learned from work in animals is that you can manipulate the length of time that experimental animals live, or just animals in general, uh, by manipulating their nutrition, basically limiting the caloric intake. It's not something that all of us are willing to do. Uh, so, and there are other things that, that have been suggested. Uh, but none of them actually seem to go beyond a limit. And that limit, that is the oldest person ever to die, whose age we can ascertain well, was 122. Uh, there's a limit around 120. There's a limit there that uh, I don't think we're likely to see broken uh, in the natural course of events. But the very fact that aging is such a reproducible phenomenon in, in our society um, with, an, with a, a, a cutoff point uh, is clearly a consequence of gene action and therefore there are genes at the basis of it and if there are genes at the basis of it we can change disease, genes as I've said. So I do see a long-term um, opportunity there. Um, and understanding aging may lead us to the genes that control the aging process. I say genes because I'm sure that it's a multigenic issue. Uh, will it have any effect on lifespan or will it simply make people live longer up to the end? I think if we just control the diseases of older age, 
cancer, cardiovascular disease, neurologic disease, that probably won't have any effect on lifespan. It will on the statistics, but not on, not on the ultimate age. Uh, so we need research on this question, but studying humans over 120 years, that's, I mean, graduate students now spend six years, um, and that's nothing in, the, in dealing with this particular problem. So we need experimental animals, and very nicely, the animals around us show the same kind of aging that we do. If any of you have dogs, you can watch the dogs aging. You know that its joints begin to hurt, that it starts losing uh, pigment in its skin, in, in, around its nose. Um, and so aging is not uh, something particular to us. We share it with at least our mammalian relatives. Uh, and so maybe all we need is graduate students who live 50, who study for 15 years, not 120. Um, now, there's a deep mystery in aging. Because all of our parts are in principle replaceable. Even the brain is to some extent replaceable. And yet, we often describe aging as a process of wearing out. The joints wear out. Uh, the mind wears out, whatever. Hearing uh, becomes less effective. Smell becomes less effective. We lose reproductive capacity. Our skin thins. And I think the reason for all of that <laughs> is that for about the first half of our life, we're the, taking advantage of the fact that evolution has been trying to make our species live longer and healthier uh, because it's good for the next generation. But even if you argue that that extends into grandparenthood, somewhere around age 60 or 70, even evolution no longer cares for us. And so we must care for ourselves. <laughs> and the future of of medicine will include us trying to fight off the ravages of age. So to sum it up, the future of medicine is to cure the diseases we understand, to understand and then cure the diseases we do not now understand, to liberate us from the process of aging. And although I haven't commented on this, an implication of the new gene editing methodologies is that we will finally try to perfect the human body, whatever that means. Thank you. <laughs>